the same. You are righteous and true. You are pure and good. You're the truth, the way, and the life. You are my hope. You are my strength. You are my all and all. I can lay back and fall into your arms and you will catch me. It doesn't depend upon me. I can do nothing for myself, but I just simply come and say, Lord, here, have your way. Have your way with me. Have your way in my heart and in my life. Do with me whatever you want. Because, Lord, I know ultimately you love me. Though I may not understand what you do, I will trust you. Though the way may seem wrong in so many ways, Lord, I will trust you. Because you've shown yourself to be faithful and true. You've been there through the hardest of times. You've done wonders in my life. Where would I be without you? I was in darkness and in a dungeon. I had no hope, but now you are my hope. So I come this morning with praise. I will come with thanksgiving. I will say thank you, Lord. Thank you for your mercy, which is new this morning. Thank you for your grace that carries me through, that makes a way. Lord, I praise you. You're worthy. You're worthy. Take, take our efforts, take our praise, take our words, take and sanctify it. Lead us and guide us. But Lord, that you would be pleased. That you would feel at home in our midst. That we would not offend thee. That I would not offend you, Lord. But I would pray and ask in truth. Lord, you know when it's true and when it's a lie. I might not know I'm lying, Lord, but you know. I want to come to you in truth. And Lord, you are the King and the Lord of all. And I shall have no other God. There shall be no other God before you. And you will work in my heart till there is nothing, no one that comes before you. I give you praise. So let it arise this morning. Anoint the congregation. May the praises of God, may the joy of the Lord rise up this morning. Let it come before you. Let it rise up as a sweet incense. Come, Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We welcome you in our midst. We welcome you in our hearts. We welcome you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We praise you and welcome you this morning. You're worthy. You're worthy. You're wonderful. You're glorious. You reign and rule over all. We yield our vessels to you this morning. Come and fill us afresh and anew with your spirit, with your oils. So let us praise him. Let us lift our hearts. Let us lift our hands unto the King. Give voice to your praise. Give voice to your thanksgiving. For He is here in the midst of His people this morning. You came in the door. He came with you. We come today, Lord. We want to worship you. We want to sing praise to you. In one, in one purpose, in one heart. A heart full of love and gratitude for who you are and what you've done and what you're doing. We praise you. We bless you. We love you with the love that you put within our hearts. It's not of ourselves. It's from you. Anything good comes from you. It's all you. You alone. You alone. You alone are worthy. You alone are worthy. You paid the price.
price on Calvary for me, for us. That blood cleanses and covers in life. For there is life in the blood. There is life in the blood that we praise you. Oh, we lift our voice this morning. Oh, welcome. Welcome, O King. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Oh, bless you. Let it rise. Let it rise. Let it rise. Give voice. Give voice to your praise. Give voice to your praise. Oh, let it come forth through the musicians. Oh, as they play their, music, their song, let it come. Let that song come through the instruments this morning as an act of worship and praise. As we sing our songs, take it, Lord. May it be your songs. May the song of the Lord arise. Let it arise, oh God, for you are worthy. You are worthy. You shall have no other gods before you. Oh, King, our God is great. Our God is good. Our God is mighty. Mighty to save. My life is in you, Lord. My strength is in you, Lord. My hope is in you, Lord. It's in you. It's in you. My life is in you, Lord. My strength is in you, Lord. My hope is in you, Lord. It's in you. I will praise you in all of my life. I will praise you in all of my strength. With all of my life. With all of my strength. All of my in you because of who you are I give you glory because of who you are I give you because of who you are I will lift my voice and say
He's your Lord. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He is the rock in which we stand. We stand on the rock that does not move. He is the same. We can count on him for anything. Because of who he is. So many more names. You can name them. These are not suggestions. This is who he is. And there's so much more of him that we do not know. But we want to know. I want to know. Don't you want to know him more? Don't you want to know the God that died for you? Don't you want to know how great he is? We've just tasted just a little bit. And there's so much more. Should we ever be reaching for more of you? More of you, Lord. Less of me and more of you. Oh, wonderful Lord. I lift my heart. I lift my voice in praise. Because of who you are. It doesn't matter who I am. It doesn't matter where I've come from. It's because of who you are. Is that what you've done for me? Yes, it's wonderful what you've done. But you're worthy. Whether you do anything for me, you're worthy. Whether you stop, Lord, you're worthy. You're worthy. Because of you, you are, I give you glory. Because of who you are, I will give you praise. No matter what I go through, let the praise arise. In who you are, I will lift my voice and say, Lord, I worship you because of who you are. Oh, my Jaira, you're my provider. Is the world, mankind, selfless, godless world salvageable? Is there hope for mankind, for the fool? That Psalm 14, 1 describes the fool. Says that in his heart there is no God. They are corrupt. None does good. The Lord looked down from heaven on the children of man to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They've all gone aside. They're all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge? Of the evil tree that they have no knowledge that comes with the tree of life. Sometimes the union of a man and his wife is broken. Communication is broken. And a silent impasse begins. Two strangers living under one roof.
describes mankind of many times in history, but especially now. Can there be reconciliation? Can the silence of man turning his back on God and God being there's no man that doeth good many times has done before taken distance from the intervention of man's daily lives until man says God is dead. He's no longer here. He's no longer interested. He no longer talks to us. Well, neither do you talk to him. Can prayer change what is happening? The past 50 years of evil in this world, in my generation, that I've seen. 50 years of church, have they avoided ungodliness no the righteous prayers have changed individual lives families circumstances maybe even villages or s small cities but they have not changed the world can the world be rescued is the question and the answer in part lies in one of the songs we just sang because of who he is not anymore who the church is or the righteous is but because of who he is it all comes down to the tree God planted two trees, the tree of life, which is what God is, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was the abode of the serpent. That was his house and is still his dwelling. And the fruits of that tree have been infecting mankind to this very day. All of humanity partook of the fruits of that tree. The parents gave to their children, their children to their grandchildren. For many generations, until all humanity except one person had eaten and had that evil within their DNA. And that one person that had not partaken of that evil. So when God looked at the whole rest of the world, he said, there's nothing, not one. They're all evil. I will destroy the world. And he sent this mighty flood to destroy the world and save Noah and his family of eight. It was so terrible in God's sight to see eight people floating on the waters and cadavers filling the earth beneath the waters. And Noah himself wondering if the other seven of his family would even have a chance to survive. Being that he was the only of Adam and Eve through Seth, the bloodline of purity and image of God. And to his fears, God brought the answer in the rainbow saying, I will not 
destroy mankind again. And yet, we've seen skirmishes where God has destroyed great parts of civilization, but never all civilization. In Israel's history, many times they embraced idolatry, left God, and then troubles made them repent, and God forgave them and rose up a judge. But then again, increasingly, 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 the world became filled with so much evil that it says God looked upon the world. And Paul says to Romans, there was not one. But God had promised not to destroy the world. How could heaven and earth be reconciled? What secret was there of heaven? And then, when there seemed to be no way out for humanity, the angels and God's creation looked upon what was happening and said, Surely, we will have another flood. God will wipe out, but there's not one man anymore. Would that be the end of humanity? And then, there was one. One thing the angels never knew could save the situation. And they marveled as God sent his son. Could that be that he was the one person, he was the... He was more than the Noah. Paul tells us he was the Adam. Again. One faultlessly created without sin. And God intervened, sent his son, and instead of killing the world, he killed his son before the astonished eyes of angels that God would allow would give his only begotten son so that the world would not perish. But have everlasting life. Where did that come from? Does God have another son to send to rescue the world today? No. Paul says, writing to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, 19. Exiling the world. Not imputing the trespasses to them, to the world. But the world now rejected the Son. Is there another Son? The writer of Hebrews 10, verse 26 said, there remains no more sacrifice for sin. There is no other son. If you reject, if you sin willfully after that, you receive the knowledge of the truth, there is no more. Paul said, the writer of Hebrews says. Is there no hope? Today, I want to speak about a gate. A gate that still has not been locked to heaven. When Jesus... The only concept... the people had of contact with God, of communion, was the temple and prayer. 
And Jesus taught them how to approach God. God's world. God's light. God's tree of life was well known to the ancient Jewish sages. That tree of life, of blessings, of life eternal. And the tree of the knowledge being earthly light, material light, the truth in lies, the truth in deception. We're living in a very special time when uh, people that are totally dead in sins, not only not awake, but dead, they claim the title of being woke. That there's a society that is not awake. Only they who have eaten so much of the tree of knowledge, that have passed on the knowledge in the universities. The elite are the only ones who know, who have the high knowledge. But anything that's taught by the serpent is lying knowledge, is fake light, is fake awakeness. There is, there is an awakeness. There is an enlightenment that comes from the tree of life where light shines. My thoughts, God said through Isaiah 55, 8, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Your ways are not my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways. I'd like to share with you the teachings in the old writings and traditions of the Jewish sages about the tree of life. They refer to God Almighty in his essence, who he is. Infinite one, when they refer to God. And they list ten it's hard to describe the word they use, but emanations or attributes or emissions or revealings or manifestations of himself. That that was the tree of life. They call it the ten sephirot. The first is, is called Keter, or crown, which is his will. His thoughts, what we just read about. That is there above what he wants. Everything, even our prayers, must be filtered through his will. That's why Jesus said when you pray, pray, not my will, but yours be done. For everything must pass. Through his willing for it to be. The second is called Hukmah, which is wisdom. Of course, to everything add infinite. The third is Bina, understanding, infinite understanding, seeing all things. The fourth is has said loving kindness. The fifth is Javura, might or judgment, also called Din. His judgment, his power to judge. The sixth is Tiferet, which is beauty. The next is Hod, a splendor. The next is Netza, victory. These are all who he is, because of who he is, we sang. Those things that 
in our small little mind can get close to even imagining what infinite means. The ninth is Yesaw. And the tenth is called Makhut or Shekinah. I think you'll recognize that. Which is also known as sovereignty. Shekinah is the way through which we experience God. We experience his presence as Moses did. The glory of the divine presence for the sages has always been expressed as light because when he revealed himself to Moses, it was in fire, in light. When he appeared, it was in fire, in light. In fact, when Moses was before the presence, Shekinah of God, which is the only thing we can approach, they say. It's, it's what we experience God through his presence. His being here with us. And that light that he was exposed to when Moses came back down finally from the mountain, it says his face shined, emitted light. Glorified is a word to express also the shine. That word means to shine like Moses is. And that is the gateway that connects man to God and God to man, light. Man can be in darkness in his sins and suddenly something happens. A ray of light from God brings into his heart a realization that he needs forgiveness that he is a sinner. That, uh, that does not come from man. That is a ray of light coming out from God. And the sinner is illuminated. Light comes upon him. And from that moment on, it's light from his presence that brings us closer and closer and expands our inner man. It is light that draws us like the moth to a fire. It's the light of his love that we feel from the Shekinah of his glory. Love from the cross raised up that draws mankind. Light then is the gateway that connects man to God. And then man responds, speaks, prays, cries, longs, desires God. So that sovereign Shekinah glory is God reaching out to man. All the other of his attributes that is broken and unexistent in man anymore. The world... was on the brink of total annihilation when Jesus was about to be born, or before he was born. And then Jesus came. What happened there? The scripture says, mercy and truth met together. 
righteousness and peace met, kissed, used. Salvation. Jesus was sent the answer to evil, to destruction, to sin. Death eternal. The answer was God, God, God ended the stalemate. God played the card nobody knew existed. The possibility that his son could save the world to the astonishment of devils and angels that such a thing existed. God so loved the world. And there on the cross, justice that demanded death and peace that cried out, salvation came. Glorious salvation came. Today, though, I'd like to be extensive and enter into a relationship to God through prayer. But maybe some other time. But I would not like to mention some quickly. The prayers of one person. It is written, the prayers of a righteous man. One righteous man availeth much. We see the prayer of Moses saving the incipient nation of Israel that had just left Egypt. The prayer of one man God heard. One man. One man. One man that had the intensity, that had the faith, that had the acceptance of who the recipient of that prayer was and his greatness. Yet, at the same time, the prayers of a sinner, one man, one man, as Jesus told us, in the prayer of the Pharisee and the prayer of the sinner, how all the words of his mouth of the Pharisee could not reach through to touch God. And yet, the prayers of one sinner who said, Woe is me, for I am undone. reached the heart of God. And Jesus said he was heard. Prayers. Prayers. You know, today, well today, for almost 2,000 years, the Jewish people use prayers they have learned and that has been passed by from generation to generation. We've heard them. You have heard them with me. They almost sound like monologue, repetitious words with no heartfelt anything. The eyes open and like robot, robots. Where do these prayers come from? All these different prayers for different occasions. When the temple was destroyed, and at last, there could be no more sacrifice for sins. The remaining priest and those that were the tribe of Levi began writing prayers. 
And those prayers were added to the prayers of other rabbis, the prayer of other rabbis, the prayer of other rabbis. So today we have prayers. Much like the Pharisees that Jesus said, with your mouth, you mouth prayers, you say words, but your heart is far from me. He said this in Matthew 15. And yet, prayer being so important that Jesus said, it's God's house. His house is a house of prayer. Yes, prayer, any person's prayer, especially a repentant sinner's prayer, seems to get through and reach out to that gateway, the only gateway we have to heaven, which is through that light, through his presence. And Jesus was the Shekinah on earth, God's presence with us, Emmanuel, God with us, the gate to eternal life. I am. Come to me, I am. The light, the life, the door. No one can come to God except through me. He was the Shekinah on earth. God in Christ said. So prayer of one righteous man, like Moses, like Elijah, that brought down fire from heaven, and the Jews were brought back to God and repented and left Baal worship. And the prayer, like I said, of one sinner. But there's other prayers, according to the Jewish traditions, and to Christian traditions also, which is the words that are heard from two. Two that are united. They call it collective prayer. And the Christian tradition, we know that Jesus said in Matthew 18, 20, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. Which means I'm there, I hear, I see. That's called a collective prayer. And yet, those two or three are not able to cause God to do something that is not in his desire or his will. That's why I said. And his wanting to do something. Jeremiah 15.1. The Lord said to Jeremiah. Though Moses. Though Samuel. Stand before me. Yet. I would not change my mind towards this people. I'll cast them out of my sight and let them go forth. So he released them and they went to Babylon as slaves. So there are times when even two or three gathered, that collective prayer of righteous, godly, high elite, if you could use that word, like Moses and Samuel cannot do it. And yet, there's another prayer described. And that is the prayer of quorum. And the minimum quorum... Ten minimum people gathered in one place. That was the rule established by the sages. That certain prayers required that quorum consisting of at least ten. And the participants had to be able to hear and see each other. So, social distancing, they can still see each other. 
According to the Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud, there's two, one is Babylonian, the other is Jerusalem Talmud. In Numbers 14, it says he heard the words of ten that were gathered. There was a quorum. Numbers 14, 27, and that recalls the story of ten spies that returned from the promised land and their report that God heard this is what he said when he heard that numbers 14 27 how long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel which they murmur he is talking about the ten Spies that murmured. Another source of the quorum is from the book of Genesis 42, 3 and 5. When ten of Joseph's sons went down to Egypt, pushed by the famine and the hunger, and pled for help before Joseph where it says ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain and the children of Israel went down to buy grain from Israel refer to just ten people we all recall the number ten in Sodom and Gomorrah Genesis 18 where Abraham pleads with God to, to not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and he says if there's 50 righteous God said okay if there's 50 righteous I won't destroy it then he said well if there's 45 that's still okay how about 40 that's okay how well what if there's 30 that's still enough how about 20 yeah, there's quorum here. I'll hear him. Well, what if there's ten righteous people? Ten, well, that's the minimum quorum, but ten people's enough. But the number doesn't go any lower. And yet there was Lot. He was a righteous man. So evidently there was situations where that minimum was not enough. Or was enough, but less than that was not enough. And that's where they get the quorum from. But now, I want to talk about the gate. A prayer that went through the gate and saved the world. Abraham was blessed by God. Not only blessing him, but his children, his grandchildren. And he said the nations of the world would be blessed. Abraham blessed Isaac, his son, and Isaac blessed Jacob before his death. Dividing the blessing among them. And uh, we see, we just talked about what happened. They went to Egypt. The blessing was there with them in Egypt. They prospered in Egypt. And then something happened. They began to forget God. They began to be silent towards God. Till there came a time... That the only people that even remembered God. This is very interesting. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob referred to God with different uh, names. Adonai, Elohim, El Shaddai, Jehovah Jireh. And yet... In Israel, in Egypt, there came a time 
where the Levites only addressed him or knew him as God. Like we would say Allah here. Elohim, the general expression of a God, a Lord. So they had been reduced in their prosperity, like the world today, in their prosperity. Mankind seems to forget his need of God. And in his poverty or his sickness, he remembers the Almighty. And the children of Israel that multiplied in Egypt and were so prosperous they did not need God, they forgot God. And thus, they were destined to forget God and thus be shunned by God. So what would God do? They turned their back on God and God for 400 years. Turned his back on those that did not want him. 400 years. In their power, in their political power, in their official status in the government of Pharaoh, in their might of finances, of money, of riches. They turned their back on God. God turned his back on them, gave them over to their enemies, and they became slaves. And only the Levites remembered there was a God. The old ancient Jewish teachings what they call it, called the gate of tears. And they say even when the gates of prayer are closed, the gates of tears still remain open. The tears of one man, the tears of one woman. We have the example of Hannah, the mother of the future of prophets of Samuel. Of the school of the prophets. She was praying to God to have a son. It said she wept. And because she wept, her request was granted. Hundreds of years later, Hezekiah was announced by prophet Isaiah that he would die and not live. And he was sick. And in reply, Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and began to weep greatly. He used the word bitterly. Not with bitterness, but weep because he didn't want to die. And Isaiah was leaving the palace while Hezekiah was sobbing. Perhaps even Isaiah could hear those sobs and he knew it was because of his evil and his sins and yet God said hey, Isaiah wait go back his tears his tears against a wall of a man as Hannah's as a woman, went straight to the heart of the Almighty. And his will was, I will let you live 15 more years. Isaiah, go back, tell him, you weren't wrong, but God said, because of your tears, I will give you 15 more years. And thus it happens. The gate of mercy was open. Going through the gate of tears. And once in a while, it is the cries of affliction of multitudes. 
in wars, in terrible destruction of weather. The cries of affliction of multitudes in pandemics, in world wars, in things that no man can control, that come upon mankind. And the cries of affliction causes God on his own will and volition to break that divorce that man has declared, to break that impasse where the two parties don't even want to talk to each other and get to the point of saying like Back in the 50s, I think, that's when they wrote that book. God unilaterally, unilaterally reaches down from man when man isn't even looking towards heaven. But it takes affliction. When the conditions of the slavery of the children of Jacob or Israel after decades and centuries of affliction, of slavery, it became unbearable. And the thousands upon thousands begin to cry. Not to God because they didn't know God. God. They cried out. God said to Moses, I've heard their cry because of their affliction. They didn't pray. It said they cried. Not seeking a way out. There was no way out. There was no God they could trust in. They didn't even know who God was. They knew the gods of the Egyptians, the golden calf. But that was an Egyptian God. It didn't help the slaves. God says, I heard, I heard the cry of their affliction when millions of sinners cried, the Creator was shaken. And then, and then, near Mount Sinai, it began to burn. They cried. Oh, will humanity in the grip of this pandemic become so touched that they'll begin to cry in their fear, in their panic? As everything they look towards, the economy, their strengths, their hopes on the military power, or their hopes in man's ability to do anything, will the burning fires cause them to cry in California, cry in Oregon, cry in Oregon, in Washington. Will the death of children, of brothers, of sisters, will a cry be born
what can we say? We can say nothing. Can we say we know what's happening? No, all we know is something is happening and it has nothing to do with Wall Street. Something is happening and it has nothing to do with the flu. Something that caused the world to stop. Who causes the world to stop? It is written, God says, is there even a tumult in the city and I have not been there? Can something like this happen and not be an intervention from the Most High God? You say, oh, I don't want this. God, if this will bring a cry to mankind, let it be tenfold. Eight of tears. Hear the cry of the mourning families. Hear the cries of the parents of those shot in the streets. Hear the cries of evil in government. Hear the cries of corruption. Hear the cries of people affected by evil and by eating of the tree of death. Oh, it doesn't mean they were crying out to God. They didn't even know God existed. To them, when you mention God, they say, well, that's church. That's worse than there's more corruption there. God, they don't know God or even God exists. Will the cry, will the divide, the chasm between earth and heaven be bridged? If it will, it's because God. There is nothing man or scientist, anybody can do, but God can make the bridge if the cry rises up with enough intensity to break through that gate and reach will that virus awaken a cry or everything else that is coming and will come, will that awaken the cry? I pray, oh God, awaken this cry in this nation. Awaken this cry. In the nations, in Europe, in Spain, in Asia, awaken that cry in China. And let the oppressed, by your mercy, by your unilateral act of love towards me, even though you must afflict him, so he turns. Almighty afflict us that we might be turned. Yes, that cry that so many times has changed history Change history from the catacombs and the Colosseum to world wars and now coronavirus. Let the heavens hear earth cry. Oh, and none of us wants affliction. You might say, well, maybe in affliction of the world, I'll be caught in there too. Well, God's going to always take care of his people. Don't worry. He always has. In all the afflictions of the world and wars and everything, he's always kept his people. And he always will. Because of who he is. Not because of us or the Christians that are praying. They've been praying 
ever since they were born. Fifty years, their prayers have not changed society. God, have mercy on America. And I know a lot of people's hopes are placed in politics on this man or that man. But like I sang, our hope, our hope is not in man. Our hope is in you. Can you say amen to that? Our hope is in you. God, whatever is necessary, save us. Hoshea now. Save us now, Lord, no matter what, the affliction, the death, the situation that might have to happen here in the States or other places in the world, for you to shake us, for you to separate your people, your sheep from the goats. Whatever must be done, we will trust in you. Will you trust in him? The God that you know, the God that he's revealed to you, trust in him. Don't look at what's happening. Don't look at what will happen. Trust him. Trust him. As Job said, I will trust him. Though he slay me, I will trust him. Will you trust him? Can we sing that once again? My hope is in you. I trust him. Trust him. Trust him. Trust him. Don't look at what happens. Trust him. He, he is always who he is because of who he is. We can trust him. He hasn't failed us in the past. His will has always been the best, hasn't it? Hasn't it? For our lives. So let's trust him. Let us trust him with our future. Let, him trust, let us trust him with the next election. Let us trust him with his will for America. Let us trust him in his will, in his will for the rest of the world. Let us trust him. Let us trust him. My hope is in you, Lord. Can you put the words up again? My life is in you, Lord. My strength is in you, Lord. My hope is in you, Lord. It's in you. Could you stand with me and declare, My life is in you, Lord. Is in you, Lord. My hope is in you, Lord. It's in you. Could you declare that? As you look at your life, you look at the city, you look at the states, at the future, what's going on in this country, in other countries, the country where you live. Can you look at the world and then look up and say, My life is in you, Lord. My children, my family, my finances, everything I have, it's in you. My life is in you, Lord. My strength is in you, Lord. My hope is in you, Lord. It's in you. And when? When you have no more strength. When everything seems impossible. 
when you prayed, when you fasted, try the gate of tears. Tears can reflect so many things, anger, frustration, but it's not those tears that go through that gate. They're tears of deep desire that cannot be expressed by my Father which art in heaven. But cannot be expressed with I need this, I need that. Which words cannot say it. But a soul and a spirit in affliction cries out to the almighty living God with the tears splatter against the wall and the floor what words cannot say tears scream they cried out to the and the bush caught fire it doesn't always happen immediately sometimes you can't make the connection between a bush and what's happening in Egypt. But you'll find out. You'll find out. That a little bush in the middle of nowhere caught fire. And the rest is history. They didn't see the bush. They didn't know God had even heard or there was a God to hear. But the Almighty, the loving, the long-suffering, the just, the righteous, the Creator, the Living One, heard. And a small, small thing happened. That all, that's all it takes to change everything. A small thing happened. Maybe, maybe before this is through, a light will turn on in a laboratory. Or in a dream. Maybe a thought. Who knows? It doesn't really matter. It's God that does things through a mighty shaking, through a war, or through a civil war, or through death, or through life, or through a virus. He does things as He wish. But He's a God that when the Shekinah meets His power and judgment, mercy is born. My life is in you, Lord. My strength is in you, Lord. My hope is in you, Lord. It's you, it's in you. I will praise you with all of my heart. I will praise you with all of my strength. With all of my life, with all of my strength, all my hope is in you. Once again, I will praise you with all of my life. I will praise you with all of my strength with all of my life with all of my strength all my hope is in you can we just shout that all my hope is in you one two three all my hope is in you Hallelujah!
hope of the world, the hope of my life.